Okay, this is about some vending machine postage. There's two sets of them. We're going to look at them in detail here. They're also called in the catalog, they're referred to as computer vended postage, and they get a CP designation in their catalog numbers. There's two issues. Uh, there's five issues in total. The first two issues use this image for the Maple Leaf in Canada. The third, fourth, and fifth issues from 2014 to 20, oh, 2020, I see there's an extra number there, uh, use the images of, we'll see, we'll, we'll look at them in, in detail, but it's interestingly because these stamps lose their value with time. And we'll go into a lot of detail about that. Even though it says permanent. Correct. So in the first issue, CP9, 1 to 9, there's 10, uh, 9 different values. Here's three of them, the 61 cent for domestic, 105 for U.S. and 180 for international. And then there's some other intermediate rates. I'm not sure what they are for, but that's fairly straightforward. Uh, these stamps now have a catalog, <laughs> wonderful investment if you bought them. At 61 cents, they have catalog value of $100 each. Hmm. Now, if you got them between around December 12th and that first month that they were issued, because the second, and they had a guideline variety too, sorry. I'm into varieties. And in this case, we see a guideline up in the upper right. And here it is there. The guidelines highlighted both on the right and, and in the upper right corner. And on the regular versions, you don't see the guidelines. And they have a premium for the varieties with guidelines. The second issue, CP10 to 18, it came out a month later. And there was obviously a price increase from 63 right up to 375. But again, it's the nine values. Um, again, the US went up to $1.10. And international went up to $1.85 and some other various extraneous, extraneous varieties. I'm not sure. Double weight, obviously. And and uh, the first printing was the January 14th. And the second was the week of March 15th, according to the catalog. And the trial period ended in late July when the machines were removed. And they say that if, in order to have proper used versions, they have to be used in period. Where were these machines placed? In post offices? You'll see them. We'll see. They're, they're, they're in, in post offices around wherever. I don't know where they were placed. Sorry. Mm -hmm. I have not in all cities. We'll see the the uh, some of the cities in Canada, the major post offices. But Unitrade, now for this particular second issue, there were first printing and a second printing. And Unitrade describes it as having a maple leaf composed of a pattern of small dots for the first printing and larger dots for the second printing. And in this the sketch, it appears to look like it. Well, the reality is not quite the same as what Unitrade believes. The first printing in small size dots. Here is the second print, first and second. I did I zoomed in on 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 this these two stamps are definitely first and second printing. And I zoomed in on this particular area of the stamps. And there's the leaf I was focusing on. And then within the leaf, I focused on a particular line of dots running diagonally through it, right up to the very tip. And then I took those and cut them out and put them on top of each other. Yes, this dot's a little bit bigger than that one. These are about the same. This one's a little bit smaller than that one. But in general, I would say that there's no apparent difference in dot size. Now, I've just given you one example, but you can expect that the, the scientist and the, and, the, and the specialist in me likes to look at all dots. I look throughout the stamp. I just use this example as a good one. There's no apparent difference in dot size between the first and second printing. But there is a difference in the location of the dots. The printing could be done that way. It's, it is a dot matrix printing. I mean, the different colors would be in different positions because that's all. It's, 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 it's a printing of a different colors in different. The blacks, for example, are in different dots, but that's just um, a registration shift. Also claim that the Canada is silver in color and shiny on the first printing and gray in color and flat 
on the second printing. And in that case, they're correct, because that's what I used to identify these two stamps that I had as being first and second printing. Here's the, I had to overlay them to be able to get the reflection and take the light, get a good image. This, this, any scanning blows away any reflection, any shininess. So this is just with, with natural light and a, and, a, and a smartphone. But what we do see that the Canada here is silver and shiny. And under the same light here in the second printing, the Canada is gray and dull. Very correct in their, in their analysis of the, uh, the distinguishing first and second printings. But they don't say in Unitrade is that the border colors are also reversed. The first printing here, this one here, the gray print, the, the border around it is gray and dull. While in the second printing, the border is silver and shiny. So they've just switched the colors. My hypothesis is that it would seem as though they simply loaded the wrong ink, the wrong colors into the ink chambers for the two uh, printing patterns. So what was supposed to be silver and shiny in one is, and they just switched them. And I can understand how easily that could be if you're loading a machine and you happen to switch the cartridges for this printer, the ink cartridges. Here's some, the second issue also had guideline varieties. Here are the examples. It doesn't have the guidelines here, but on this example, this strip here, it does very clearly have the guidelines. And you can also see a little bit of a guideline on the right side there. On the first row, on the far left, upper left corner of the first stamp. I oh, see there's also the one there too. You're right. Now that's yeah. interesting because it can be up solid lines, upper right or upper left. I did not see that. Thank you. Mm. I never saw that upper left guideline. The upper left guidelines are rare and they're even higher price premium. Oh. So the second printing has dotted lines upper right only. And price me with guidelines between three to five times the price. Thank you. Thank you. So the second issue here is another complete set of second issue, all with guidelines upper right. Here is CP13 from that second printing, second issue on cover. Mailed to Germany with the barcode. I'm surprised the barcode's on the front, not the back, but I don't know, maybe that was a US or German barcode. Here's another example of a pair. They obviously used a pair um, because presumably you only had two covers to mail and didn't want to buy a, a five, the higher international rate postage because two of these would, would have sufficient for international rates. Here's an international rate, CP14 at $1.85 over to uh, Taiwan and in, in the Republic of China and with a poke on and the receiving postmark, it looks like it actually, my instinct says, I think it was carried. I don't think it actually went by airplane, but other than that, it would have taken a month. It looks like it's from the 22nd of March to the, the 4th of April. Well, it probably was somebody traveling and getting favorite cancels at both ends. What is the catalog value of that uh, second second printing? Is it more or less than the first? Oh, they're only about less than five, six, around six dollars, ten dollars, mint, yeah. less than ten dollars each of them. They're very calm, much more common. Here we're looking at the third, fourth, and fifth issues, CP nineteen to sixty eight. They all feature landscapes by five Canadian printers. That one's already on painters, not printers. Painters. This is already on another Canadian stamp issue. One from Emily Carr, James Edward, Har James Edward Harvey McDonald, Tom Thompson, Albert Henry Robinson, and Arthur Lismer. These are the five paintings that were used on these 50 stamps. And there's 10 denominations for each of these five Canadian painters. Emily Carr, you can see the numbers. James, Tom Thompson, Albert, again, 10 more. Arthur Lismer, a total of 50 stamps in these third, fourth, and fifth issues. October 2016 was the first set of, of four issues, 20 stamps, mm -hmm. 
Um, they also had an 18 digit code version and then a 14 digit code. We'll see it in a second. The first six digits of the of the code reflected the post office where the machine was. The second issue, the fourth issue, was three years later. Price increase was only not that significant. I would have expected higher price increases. And then the fifth issue, CP54 to 68, these were only 15 cents. So because the P stamps didn't need to be reissued because they were the same P stamp, the permanent. Your forever stamps. Here are three strips still sealed in the Canada Post plastic sleeves showing the permanence and the code. All three packages have this, uh, 15 stamps and all 15 stamps have the same code. And it's from a Vancouver post office. It's interesting that it's 0001. It would suggest it's number one, first one. It should be valuable. Well, we have a little bit of a problem because that's what they look like now. The fundamental problem, the ink fades with time. The values of denomination and code disappear. And I guess with that, I think the value disappears too. The thermal printers use chemically treated paper that darkens when heated by a thermal print head. Direct thermal printers do not use separate ink, toner, ribbon, and supplies. And that's what makes it very attractive because you never, Ever have to replace the ink cartridge or whatever it is. There's a lot of chatter on YouTube if you search for thermal print inkers and receipts and things like that. Uh, it took me a while to find out the real answer, um, but this is it. And that reaction, that thermal reaction, the heating uh, can be reversed with autolysis or light energy and heat. Just gradually, if you've ever purchased a re of something and had a, a receipt that you kept for a guarantee and five years later, you look at the guarantee receipt and the printing's all gone. That's exactly the same phenomenon. So how did I get those images? <laughs> well, well, let's, what we did actually here is if you look very carefully at it, you can see the word permanent here and the faded printing and the code. So you can see it on, on the permanent stamps, I could see it. On the others, I couldn't. We'll see, look at that. Here's the permanent, permanent one. So if the, how did I get the images? I tested over oh, 100 different fonts and found the one that I, that I felt best matches the, the Canada Post font, something called Oswald. And then I printed it directly on the stamp with an HP Office Jet Premium printer. And that's what it looks like. Is it perfect? No. Is it darn close? Yes. Were these things uh, printed at the machine when you bought it so they could... Per yes, I. this was definitely printed at the machine. Okay. Because you would then, it would be one coil of stamps and you would say, yes, I want permanent, I want domestic rate, I want international rate, or I want the other rate. So you would pr program the, the computer to whatever... Uh, denomination and value you wanted, so that would be printed instant right there at the at the computer at, at, for the third, fourth, and fifth. These were the permanent portion was printed at the time of purchase. Yeah. You can see my Oswald font wasn't perfect. My P is a little bit fatter than it should be. It should be a little bit skinnier, but that was the best that I got because I wanted to keep the the width of the characters. Mm -hmm. It had to be in very mm -hmm. narrow font. And numbers aren't quite good. I, maybe someone else can, I should, my daughter suggested I crowdsource this to find the perfect font, but uh, this is as close as I got. There's the permanent and there's the number I came up with. Again, not perfect. I wanted to make sure that I had the right curves and the numbers and things like that. So here I printed a whole strip of five um, with one of the strips that's beside it that was blank. I did them in strips of five on a computer printer, the permanent stamps. All those as forgeries or counterfeits, right? But yeah, they're, but they're, they're, they are the original value. There's no, there's no defrauding Canada Post at all. No, but I just restored the value that was there originally. Oh no, it doesn't count. Mm -hmm. Have you tried oh, using these? Do you, do you think the post office would accept that? I'm guaranteed they would accept it because they wouldn't check. 
Yeah, well, that you can be pretty sure of. But yes, they are certainly not genuine. They're certainly, I guess I call them forgeries. Maybe 50 years from now, people will be looking back at the Jansen forgeries. It's not <laughs> yeah. really forgeries and somebody else's forgeries. <laughs> but guess what? Here's the fourth issue. These were strips I bought as a set. Kiosk set. In this case, the ink is completely faded. There's nothing left. There's a bit of a watermark. You can see a hint of a watermark in the paper, but that's nothing to do with the, the thermal printing. I got as close as I could with the font. Not perfect, because I had to find a font that I wanted a curve in the one, because that's what required. I wanted the seven to be curved, not straight. Many fonts feature sevens straight and, and ones with a straight curve or no curve or a and zeros. I had to come up with something that this is the best I could come up with for the fourth issue. And guess what? For the fifth issue, another set I bought with how the ink is completely faded. Um, again, with the Sur 7 and the nice one. The two isn't perfect, but it's as close as I could get in terms of fonts. But I'd look through about 100 fonts to come up with something that was right. I have a massive Excel spreadsheet with the different font columns at the top and numbers on the left and denominations and X's and orange areas and green areas showing which ones I like and which ones I didn't like. I am going to be using some of these. I, to me, I, they're more important used than they are mint. How does the catalog value, do they remark that the uh, the ink will, the printing will fade? No, they have not mentioned anything about this in the descriptions. It's funny because the photos they have in the catalog, in Unitrade catalog, already show faded values. Here are some examples now of these covers. CP, the high of the fifth issue on cover. CP64, the latest issue with uh, the Emily Carr stamp. And this one, I'm only assuming it's $1.30 because it's paid, it was sent by my daughter to me in, 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 in Qatar. And she used one of the presumably $1.30 stamps plus two piece stamps to make up an international rate. So I'm assuming it's $1.30. There's no hint of anything in it. And this was just at the time of COVID when there was no air delivery to Canada. And so I'll see it on the next example, what actually happened. It is a reserve service label on it. This is what happened when FEH, the dealer in Vancouver mailed me a cover with the stamps on it and it was returned to him and you can see a bit of a two there so yeah this was must have been the 271 designation here's another example of a cover that he sent again with the return to center label on it and postmarked um april 7th of 2020 and then what the idea was that once Plane serve. Well, there were no flights to Qatar, so there's no way that Canada Post could get mail to Qatar. So the idea was to return it to center. Then, when it's when the service is resumed, you peel off the top layer, this top layer label underneath it, and uh, then you drop it back in the mailbox. So that was this. This is a an un unusual postal marking. Here's another one from Frank, again, with the label. Here's the third one with a label. These are all, it happens to be a nice complete set. I have all five of them on set, on cover, all five artists. And this is resume service. Now, did you um, inquire as to whether this um, disappearing ink uh, could have been intentional on the part of the post office? No, I didn't inquire. Where that this would happen? As you, as you know, I lived in Qatar for many mm -hmm. years. It happened on the Qatar vending machine stamps too. Really? I had a huge inventory of Qatar mint stamps. I was an avid Qatar collector. And on those, the ink all disappeared too. It's exactly the same phenomenon. I'm wondering, did were, were there any computer vended machines produced by the United States Postal Service? Yes, I think so. Well, I think you might want to investigate them. I'd be keen to hear what's happened with the ink on those. That's it.